Hello, hello. You're listening to the Bitcoin Advocate Podcast. I'm your host, Andy. And if you're new here, welcome. This is a show where we discuss all things Bitcoin on a weekly basis. This is a show that I wish I had when I first got into Bitcoin, which is why I started this podcast. This is your one-stop shop of complex topics in the wonderful world of Bitcoin, explained in simple ways. As a reminder, this show is available on YouTube, Spotify, Amazon Music, and a whole bunch of other platforms. So wherever you might be listening from, if you like the show, be sure to follow and subscribe. You can also follow me on Twitter at twitter.com slash the BTC advocate. Today's episode is sponsored by myself. More specifically, I have a book about Bitcoin called Hyper Bitcoinization, a story about a revolution. And if you're watching this on YouTube, there's a link down below in the description. Otherwise, you can search for the title on Amazon and it should be the first result. It's not selling out if it's my own product. Last week, we talked about Bitcoin and its relationship to energy and how Bitcoin's proof-of-work consensus mechanism is not only necessary, but beneficial to the world. This week, we'll continue with our theme of discussing criticisms against Bitcoin and my responses to those criticisms. In particular, we will look at some other commonly said arguments, such as the idea that Bitcoin is worthless because it has no intrinsic value, what to say when people try to claim that they like blockchain but not Bitcoin, and the question of, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? First, let's tackle the idea that Bitcoin is worthless because it has no intrinsic value. Before we delve into the weeds of it, we first need to define what intrinsic value actually means. According to the definition I stole from Google, intrinsic value is defined as a property of anything that is valuable on its own. For instance, commodities are generally things with intrinsic value. A bag of rice has intrinsic value because you can eat it. A barrel of oil has intrinsic value because you can use it to power machines. A house has intrinsic value because it provides you with shelter. Even gold has intrinsic value since it can be used, or rather it is already currently being used, in electronics. Bitcoin, on the other hand, has no intrinsic value. You cannot eat a Bitcoin. You cannot even touch it since it's digital. Therefore, because of this, a lot of people have arrived at the conclusion that it is worthless. On the surface, this seems like a logical conclusion that one may arrive at. If I gave you a bag of rice, the value to you is obvious. Anyone can understand the value that a bag of rice would provide them. If I gave you a Bitcoin, the benefit might be less obvious. However, if you just thought about this problem a little deeper, if you insisted that everything you deem valuable have some sort of intrinsic value associated with it, the problems surface immediately. For instance, if I gave you a piece of gold, what is the benefit to you? You know that it is technically possible to use it to make electronics, uh, but pretend you don't work for an electronics factory. If you're just the average Joe, are you really going to use the gold to make electronics? Uh, Yet, if I insisted on giving you a piece of gold, it's unlikely that you'll say no. So clearly to you, it's not worthless. Taking a step further, you'll find that pretty much everyone is okay with giving up their goods and services in exchange for things with no intrinsic value. Uh, Otherwise, what is cash? Cash has no intrinsic value since it's just paper. You can't eat it, and the banknotes themselves are not useful to you in any way unless someone's willing to exchange a good or service with you and is willing to accept it as payment. Uh, So as you can see, if we insisted on always dealing with things that have intrinsic value, then you'll end up trying to figure out what portion of your house that you have to give to the coffee shop in exchange for your morning brew, uh, or how many chickens you'll have to give up to your car mechanic to get him to fix your car. This is called the barter system, and you can probably safely assume that having a modern 21st century global economy with 8 billion participants reverting to the barter system would be a terrible idea. So I really don't understand this argument that Bitcoin is worthless because it has no intrinsic value. If you really examine what happens in the real world, you'll find that people are perfectly happy transacting and storing their wealth in things that don't have intrinsic value, like money in their bank accounts. Also, if I may, I'd also like to push back a bit on the idea that Bitcoin has no intrinsic value. If you allow me to stretch the idea of intrinsic value a bit, can I say that Bitcoin's intrinsic value is in its ability to preserve wealth over time? 
My argument is that the need to store wealth over time is in fact a human need. Perhaps it is not as fundamental as our need for food, water, air, uh, but if you think about it, if you were not able to store your wealth over time, this means that you have to consume all the value that you produced right away. Uh, meaning that, for example, what if you had to spend your paycheck as soon as you get it or else your money would expire in 24 hours? Uh, and uh, when you're old and you can no longer work, well, you just have to deal with not having any money at all because, again, you're not able to save money. Uh, so I think that most people would agree that this scenario that I just described would be a nightmare. Uh, and it's clear that being able to store your wealth for later consumption is in fact a human need. With our fiat monetary system, inflation would always present a problem for savers. You can put your dollars in a bank account, and although the number itself doesn't go down, your purchasing power goes down over time. So dollars do a bad job of preserving your wealth through time. Uh, we've spent several episodes talking about how Bitcoin is uniquely designed to preserve wealth through time. So please go back and watch the six properties of money for Bitcoin episode if you need a refresher, and I won't repeat everything again here. Uh, but all I will say is that if you buy more rice than what you can consume in one sitting, uh, that's because you anticipate that you'll eventually be hungry again even though you've just eaten. Uh, and if you buy Bitcoin, that's because you anticipate that one day you'll need purchasing power when you're too old to work. So that's where I'll leave the intrinsic value argument, and I hope you found everything insightful so far. Moving on, next, I need to address the people that claim to love blockchain but hate Bitcoin. You often hear this argument touted by executives of big financial firms who want to convince shareholders and investors that, indeed, this giant stumbling bureaucracy of tens of thousands of employees, most of them age 50 or above, uh, is indeed in tune with the latest tech trends. They would say, of course we love blockchain, we just don't like Bitcoin, but blockchain is the way of the future, so uh, don't worry, I totally know what I'm talking about, please don't sell our shares. But my argument is that they totally do not understand neither Bitcoin nor blockchain. Uh, so let's break down this argument. First, what is blockchain? We have to understand that at a fundamental level, a blockchain is just a ledger. A ledger is simply a list of transactions of who has what amount of money and who has paid who. Ledgers are among some of the oldest technologies in the world. The earliest known civilizations that had writing primarily used writing for the purposes of keeping tax records. The ancient Sumerians, who lived as far back as 4500 BCE in what is now parts of Iraq and Kuwait, used clay tablets to record how many bushels of wheat were collected from a given person or location. So a ledger by itself is anything but revolutionary. It's literally been around for thousands of years. What is revolutionary about blockchain is that it's a decentralized ledger, meaning that a blockchain is a ledger that can be verified and updated by participants all over the world without any central authority being able to control the network. The key to what makes blockchain revolutionary is all about the decentralized part. Without decentralization, so having a centralized ledger, it's what we already have in the traditional financial system. Your bank keeps a record of your account and how much money you have along with millions of other customers. Your bank is solely responsible for maintaining and updating the record. They can build a blockchain if they want, but even if they build a blockchain, they'll still be the ones that are fully in control of it. So how is that different than what we already have? It's not. The Bitcoin blockchain, being the most decentralized and distributed ledger system in the world, is the most successful and meaningful example of the practical use of blockchains. So uh, saying that you love blockchain but hate Bitcoin doesn't actually make sense. Alright, last topic of the day. Now let's address a question, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? Uh, as always, we want to start with some definitions. So let's define what a Ponzi scheme is. Uh, so a Ponzi scheme is named after the famous con man Charles Ponzi, and a Ponzi scheme is a form of fraud that lures investors into an investment, quote unquote, uh, that is in reality just a system that pays profits from earlier investors with funds from more recent investors. To examine whether Bitcoin fits into the definition of a Ponzi scheme, the idea of tokenomics is extremely useful. 
Tokenomics describe the policies around the coin's distribution, production, and other economic factors that determine the fairness and long-term potential of a given blockchain project. Coins that have bad tokenomics may indeed be classified as Ponzi schemes. For example, coins may be heavily centralized, have a high inflation rate, or have a high initial total supply, also called a pre-mine, and also have a large proportion of the supply controlled by insiders or whales, which are individuals with the power to cause significant price movements, or have uh, mechanisms that are designed to reward insiders at the expense of newer members of the community, uh, or they just don't provide a clear use case or solve a real-world problem. Uh, so these are all telltale signs of a Ponzi scheme. Uh, before we delve into Bitcoin's tokenomics, it's helpful to examine the tokenomics of another coin, which is the US dollar. Bitcoin skeptics are often quick to criticize Bitcoin without holding the US dollar up to the same standard. If we were to evaluate the US dollar by the same metrics as we do crypto projects, we will find that the US dollar in fact ranks very low in terms of its tokenomics. Uh, the list of properties that make up the tokenomics of the US dollar looks something like the following. Uh, so first, it is heavily centralized, only one node, which is the Federal Reserve. There are over 20 trillion coins in total supply. It's unlimited and uncapped in terms of its maximum supply. The top 1% of people control about 38% of the total supply, according to a Federal Reserve study in 2016. Uh, the inflation rate is at least 2% per year and trending higher as time goes on. The inflation rate is not deterministic, meaning that the inflation rate can change at any time based on the whims of the management team, and also is down more than 95% in purchasing power since its creation. Besides the US dollar itself, some other points of concern are the systems that are built around the dollar. Many aspects of the dollar-based system are designed to reward insiders, or the establishment, at the expense of newcomers. In March 2023, so a few days ago from when this episode was recorded, Reuters came out with a report stating that the US Social Security program will, at its current pace, run out by 2033. The United States Social Security program was designed with the intention of having newcomers, so those who are younger who just enter the workforce, to pay into a fund which would invest the funds and use the interest generated to pay off those who have retired and can no longer work due to old age. In theory, this is not a bad idea. However, this runs into some problems in practice. Uh, first, due to a variety of factors such as increasing life expectancy, uh, Social Security will have to deliver payments to people for longer. Uh, the outflows are greater than the inflows plus the interest generated from investing the funds, uh, which means that the people who are just entering the workforce may never see any money by the time that they retire uh, and can draw from Social Security since the money would have run out by the time that they retire. Uh, so this is eerily like a Ponzi scheme, since the Social Security program is, in practice, taking contributions from newcomers and using that as payouts to people who are claiming Social Security. It is also worth noting that had one contributed to one's own retirement investment account, such as the 401k in the United States, uh, that money would have been passed on to one's family members upon death. Uh, whereas Social Security payouts stop upon death. Uh, so therefore, before one criticizes Bitcoin for supposed similarities to a Ponzi scheme, uh, it's worth examining how government-issued fiat and the systems built around it often behave more like a Ponzi scheme than Bitcoin does. Uh, Bitcoin, by contrast, represents a robust and deterministic monetary policy that cannot be changed by any one individual or party. Uh, so I hope this addresses some of the most commonly stated criticisms of Bitcoin. I don't want to overwhelm you with too many different topics, and I think I've given you enough to chew on for this week. Uh, so we'll leave the episode here. Next week, we'll continue with one more episode of addressing criticisms against Bitcoin, where I answer questions such as, has Bitcoin failed as an inflation hedge? We'll talk about that and more next week. For now, thank you all for listening. And I'll see you guys next episode. Bye-bye.